All right, well, uh, as uh, you all know by now, it wasn't uh, quite the election we'd hoped for last night. Um, I want to start uh, first and foremost by uh, thanking our candidates. Um, you know, Matt and I had a privilege of uh, recruiting a lot of candidates uh, going around the state a lot, and uh, I could not be more proud of our candidates and our members. Uh, they did a phenomenal job. Some of the best people I've had the privilege of running a ballot with uh, in 23 years of doing this, uh, I cannot tell you how uh, proud I am and how what an honor it was to serve with some of these people. Um, we had a message of uh, balancing the budget without a tax increase, uh, trying to restore a little bit of sanity to where our budget was going, uh, and then also uh, rein in the size and the scope of government. Uh, also focusing on education. Uh, those are the things we focused on before we got here. Uh, those are the things we focused on during the election, and uh, it's what we'll continue to focus on. Uh, the voters showed us a little bit different path for us last night, and uh, that's what happens every two years when we have these elections. So I uh, appreciate it. It's been an honor, um, even beyond uh, my uh, <laughs> wildest expectations, to serve uh, as Speaker of the House, uh, a, a body that I have a great deal of respect for and uh, truly... Uh, in my time here uh, will be the one thing that I uh, not only honor but cherish the most, uh, being a part of such a wonderful institution. Uh, on whether, depending on whatever side of the aisle you're on, it was an honor to serve as speaker, and uh, I look forward to uh, working with uh, the minority as we transition out. But turn it over to my cohort in crime. Well, I, I think uh, to echo the speaker's uh, sentiments, this crop of candidates that we had uh, was absolutely phenomenal knocked on over 400,000 doors across the state uh, and ran an incredibly good campaign, uh, a very vigorous campaign on the issues. And uh, I think in many instances uh, they came up against uh, some dollars, uh, against a very well-financed opposition, a very well-coordinated opposition, uh, and one that was very focused uh, on a negative message, I believe. Uh, I'm very proud of the message that our candidates ran on as well. Our message uh, that the candidates ran on was consistent and it was positive about how to move Minnesota forward. Um, uh, unfortunately, that uh, did not uh, take the day and um, congratulate uh, Representative Thiessen and the Democrats and look forward to working with them in the, in the months and the year ahead. Uh, also with Governor Dayton as he proposes a budget uh, balanced budget uh, with a Democrat legislature, a Democrat House, and a Democrat Senate. Uh, so we look forward to uh, hearing from them and working with them in the months ahead. Um, and also uh, want to thank all of our uh, very dedicated staff people who worked with these candidates and uh, activists and volunteers all across the state of Minnesota who worked very tirelessly uh, on a very difficult, long campaign. Uh, and. Um, uh, those folks uh, truly do deserve a great deal of credit. Mr. Speaker, yep. you had such phenomenal candidates. What happened? What are, what's your analysis of why you lost those seats? Well, and, and before I forget, um, the one guy that uh, I would never have ever attempted this uh, job without is Matt Dean. Um, the majority leader doesn't get anywhere near the uh, <laughs> the amount of uh, of time and respect that it deserves. But um, I, I have got to say thanks to Matt for. Uh, hanging in there. There was a lot of things that we didn't know uh, when we got this job, but uh, we learned on the, <laughs> kind of on the go sometimes, but uh, it was truly a pleasure to serve with him. So uh, without, uh, I want to forget saying a thank you with that. Uh, you know, Bill, it was uh, a national turnout. Uh, you know, an eight, a plus eight for Barack Obama in Minnesota. Uh, you look at Florida, you look at Virginia, you look at uh, Montana, you look at North Dakota. I mean, uh, seats in uh, areas where uh, a week ago, people were looking at Republican majorities, Republican wins, uh, went the other way. So I, I don't think you can say that Minnesota as a whole uh, was just, you know, we were the one state that had this happen to us. I think there's uh, a lot of, of voter turnout that, quite frankly, wasn't expected. I, I didn't expect to see a plus eight here in Minnesota. Did you make a mistake by putting the amendments on the ballot? Well, I think that's for uh, a lot of political science professors to figure out, um, you know, we put it on the ballot because we believed and our the majority of the members in the legislature believed that it was the right thing to do. Um, we can Monday morning quarterback uh, a lot afterwards, but uh, from our perspective, you know, that was what we believed was important. I still believe in voter integrity. Uh, Secretary of State said that he's uh, still going to work on it and uh, they had an idea last session, so I, I hope they continue it. I hope it wasn't, uh, you know, made in either jest or in... Uh, 
in the heat of the battle, but I think that's uh, still something that's very important. Mr. Speaker, on the campaign trail, a lot of folks did say that it was uh, gay marriage and gridlock that actually uh, forced caused them to vote one way or another. In responding again to, uh, to Rachel's question, you are a political strategist. You're the leading political strategist in the Minnesota House. Was that a mistake? Well, again, uh, you know, looking back, uh, everybody can, you know, Monday morning quarterback and say, well, you should have done this, you might have done that. Um, I will tell you what we ran on. Um, you all heard it when we were in the minority. It was making sure the Minnesota's economy was competitive with North Dakota, with Texas, with Oklahoma, with, you know, North Carolina. That's what we ran on. We ran on a competitive business climate. We ran on making sure the budget was balanced without massive tax increases. Um, that's what we ran on. That's what we talked about. Uh, what the other side did, and you know, uh, it's interesting to us that uh, Governor Dayton wasn't given blame for the shutdown as well because uh, he's the only one that could call us back into special session. He vetoed budgets uh, when we sent them to him. Uh, several of them were compromised budgets. So uh, I think uh, that'll, you know, and his, his turn will come in two years. But, you know, for, from us, from our perspective, we ran on, and we did what we promised. We balanced the budget. We didn't increase the size of government. We focused on quality education, education reform. Uh, we did all the things we said we were going to do when we got here. Some of them we even agreed with the governor on, uh, some we did not. So I think that's, you know, I don't, uh, the voters that, uh, you know, will come up and say afterwards after something's passed, I think the best example is uh, how many people voted for Jesse Ventura on election day and then how many would admit to voting for him the day after he lost. You know, it was like 30 some percent on the election day and it was 10 percent the day he retired. So I think it's just being a part of something that, uh, was either a success or a failure. Well, Mr. Speaker, did, did, those, did those amendments knock you off your message, though? Did they knock you off the message of jobs in the economy? No. I mean, we were talking about it up until the very last day. We were talking about it in Moorhead when you go up there. Travis Remke, when I was up with him on uh, Thursday or Friday, uh, you look at where their economy is going, and they're going to either eliminate or severely reduce either income property or, or sales tax in North Dakota. Uh, Travis Remke was talking about that every single day. His opponent and the, the money behind them wasn't. So it didn't knock us off our message at all. That's what they were talking about. That's what resonated with the voters, but uh, obviously not enough of them. Did it motivate, though, your opposition to come out? Did you miscalculate how much the opposition to the constitutional amendments? You know, I, again, we, we're always a high turnout state. You know, I think we're up a little bit from the 2008 number. So I, I, Minnesota's always, it's, it's always the, uh, I, I think a lot of other states where they look at voter turnout in a presidential year versus non-presidential. Minnesotans always go out and vote. That's that's, that's what we do really well here. So whether or not it was a motivational factor for most voters, I think it was right on or pretty darn close to a traditional presidential year in Minnesota. Do you anticipate an attempt by the Democrats to, uh, to legalize same-sex marriage, and will your party's approach to that issue change as a result of the amendment results? Well, uh, I think it's up to the Democrats to organize their caucus and come up with their own agenda. You know, they... <laughs> Unlike them, I'm not going to tell them what they believe and what they, they think. That's up to them to decide. Uh, but it'll be up to them to organize. Speaker, speaking of which, how does this change your agenda going forward for the Republican caucus? You know, it's going to stay the same focus on the same things, jobs and the economy. You look at the surrounding states around us, uh, the economic situation in North Dakota, in Iowa, in Wisconsin is not going to get worse. It's probably going to get better. And we are going to be at a pivoting point in our state where we're going to be high tax, high regulated, uh, ne next door to a low tax and a, a more streamlined regulatory system. And then, unfortunately, the businesses then make those decisions. The owners, the women and men who own those businesses, make those decisions. That's not up to the voters. So what are your fears or expectations with an all DFL capital? Well, that will probably be for you guys to ask them questions. Hopefully you'll ask them in, in detail what they're going to be. But uh, I think the governor said he's going to raise taxes last night. Um, I, I'm not sure if uh, the majority, uh, the new majority parties have agreed to that yet or not, but um, he ran on it, he campaigned on it, he said he thought even during a surplus that it was still something we had to do. So uh, if you're a business owner in the state of Minnesota, I would get ready for a uh, pretty sizable tax increase. I think if you want to look at what that might be, you might look backwards at what Governor Dayton proposed uh, with the Republican legislature. So uh, if you say that his proposal to make Minnesota the highest tax state in the country, if he was willing to do that with a Republican majority uh, in the legislature, or as he referred to us as alligators and crocodiles uh, for a Republican House and Republican Senate, uh, we'll be anxious to see what he is going to be proposing for a Democrat legislature, which he could presumably pass. 
And that's, uh, would that's also be ponies and bunnies over there. Then. <laughs> it will be interesting to see what uh, what they have proposed, and uh, we would look forward to their proposal uh, for what their budgets are going to be, and also how they achieve uh, those budgets with tax increases. Uh, where they expect to get uh, those balanced budgets. You have lost some key pieces of real estate in the suburbs, Edina, um, Eden Prairie, uh, Egan. And uh, do you have a plan for getting those suburbs back into a red column or at least a purple column? Because those candidates were all pretty good candidates out there. No, they were. Uh, I would. I would say they were great candidates. You know, so but how do you get? How do you? How do you get? 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 Get those seats back in, in well, suburbs that seem to have gone socially away from the issues that you were presented or that were presented in the legislative session. Yeah, I mean, you give them a day off, uh, and then you ask them to run again. You know, I think they're just as good a candidates to today as they were yesterday, as they were last week or last month or a year ago, and recruited them. Uh, you know, I think Mark Uglum is a fantastic candidate. Terry Jacobson and Roz Peterson are two business women that, you know, sadly, <laughs> in the year of the wom woman, at least in our caucus, running business woman, uh, weren't accepted. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, I think it's a sad commentary for, uh, in some of those areas, because you had real life business women that have been out there in the job force, uh, have been a part of this economy up and down, and would bring that knowledge to the capital. Uh, I think you, you know, and it's up to them to run again and candidates make these decisions. We hope they wait until, you know, at least after this weekend before they say yes uh, or say no to us. But, um, you know, they'll make the decision, but but we'll go and ask because I, I still believe they're, the candidates, our candidates were uh, better uh, fit for their districts than uh, what we saw in the results. And Cindy, if you look back two years, we were sitting in this room, we had 47 candidates. Uh, we picked up 25 seats in one year. Minnesota is an interesting place. Uh, we've uh, proven that time in and time out, and things can change very quickly. We also saw some pickups in areas in greater Minnesota uh, where we saw some candidates doing very, very well. We also saw candidates do extremely well, Stacy Stout in areas like Maplewood, doing extremely well uh, and being competitive uh, in an area that was uh, before considered ab absolute Democrat territory. So we see some changes in the contours perhaps, uh, but we've got excellent candidates ready to go and ready to come back and I think be very, very successful. Uh, but as the uh, speaker says this weekend, uh, they're out picking up their signs and dusting themselves off and hopefully these great candidates are going to run again because they would be absolutely great legislators. If you don't think that gay marriage uh, affected your campaigns and caused the loss, do you think the gridlock that we heard about it at the doors around the state and the shutdown hurt? Well, I, I, again, I, I think it's up to a, a lot of uh, college professors. Those probably do some, you know, case studies on that. They got to justify you're, you're on the ground. You're right there. <laughs> they got to justify big salaries, I guess. I don't know. I mean, need something for the kids to talk about in class. I mean, look, the uh, the, the turnout, the number of people that, that came out for the amendments, absolutely, it, it had an effect on the race. But I don't think you can say it was a the single factor. I think it was several things. Uh, you know, I, I don't think a week ago anybody was thinking that North Carolina would be as close as it was for Barack Obama between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. I don't think you know. You, you look around the country and you can make these examples all over. So I, I think it's just a presidential year. President performed better than a lot of people were expecting. Their turnout models were obviously the right ones. Ours weren't. So well, I think. What about the shutdown? You know, it, it, I, I can say, and I was. You know, in a half a dozen different districts in the last five days alone, um, it wasn't something that came up. It wasn't something that people heard at the door. You know, it, it was something that absolutely that was the key focal point for our Democrat colleagues. Um, they had a message of, of running against us. Uh, they did not have a message of something to run for, uh, other than we don't like those guys. They're going to sell out the state to the corporations. They're going to sell out grandma and the kids and the middle class and. As somebody who's smack dab in the middle class, um, <laughs> I can't wait to see what they're going to do for me because I, you know, I don't know how higher taxes in a, in a down economy is going to be an improvement for me, but I'll, I'll give them the opportunity to show. But uh, they didn't have anything they were running for. They were just running against us. Maybe you could say the same thing about Mitt Romney. That's why he lost. But uh, unfortunately here, the, the, their message with a lot more money and uh, a lot of, of uh, advertising behind it prevailed. Mr. So how, much, how important was that money? Well, and maybe a lack of money from the maybe your party and from your caucus compared to 
the DFL caucus? Well, I mean, I would say we're probably, um, you know, we'll see the end of the year reports. I, I think as a caucus, we did extremely well. I, I don't know that, that uh, we left any stone underturned. Um, <laughs> the uh, number of calls that I made, and uh, some people would probably turn off their phone as soon as they saw me calling. I didn't, there was anybody that I didn't ask at least a half a dozen times for some financial help. Uh, but when you have a, a coalition of uh, labor unions, public employee labor unions, the Ask Me, MAPE, and the Teachers Union uh, that are willing to give millions and an individual who can write an unlimited amount of, of checks for caucuses for candidates, um, that's not something we have in the Republican Party. It's the biggest misnomer out there that the Republicans have all these big fat cat donors that write big checks. We don't. It's well, the Democrat Party. Did Bob Cummins ever write a check to the caucus? Uh, yes, I think he did. I don't know. What about Earlier's your part? The Republican Party seemed to be decimated uh, with financial problems, with scandal. Did that have an effect? You talk about the Democrats having a lot of money or labor unions. What about the Republican Party? Uh, yeah, we did. We did not have the the, especially from a, a financial standpoint, the the resources that we would have liked. Absolutely, I we've admitted that for the last two years. Um, but it didn't mean you know I was at a phone bank on uh, on Monday night and we had more volunteers than we had phones. So. The, the volunteer effort was there. The enthusiasm was there on behalf of our candidates. Um, we went through the phones. I, I got a, at least a dozen people that said, yes, you've called me four times. I've already voted. Stop calling me. So I don't think from that standpoint, you know, our party wasn't in disarray. We had the, the, the usual blocking and tackling that we have that goes with that. Um, I just think it was the money that in the, the massive amounts of money that were spent on the other side. And when you have, you know, 14, 15, 22 negative mailings about you uh, and about what you would or wouldn't do before you'd even been elected, that's hard for a lot of people to survive, especially someone who's never been elected to a public office before. Um, it's a pretty sad commentary because there were some great people out there that for the first time stepped up and said, you know what, I'll run for office, I'll give this a try, and to have you know, 14 or 18 negative mailings saying what he or she did just because they were seen. Are you saying that the negative mailings, I, I, Old and I don't hear well. Um, you know, the negative oh, mailings. The negative mailings are a one-sided deal. Oh no, we, we're happy to draw a contrast with uh, candidates that either supported tax increases, uh, voted against EBT cards being used for drug for uh, uh, booze and cigarettes. Absolutely. If you, I'll be happy to go on a record. But uh, to say that Travis Remke stole 2.2 billion dollars from kids is a lie. He I never, it, never it, voted for that. It, the intensity, they were coordinated, they were focused, they were financed, and they were excruciatingly negative and untruthful. I think that we can say that. Uh, Stacy Stout is not responsible for Medicare cuts. I, I, can, I think we can all understand that someone who's running for a legislative seat doesn't have anything to do with Medicare cuts. Um, but I think the, the Democrats also uh, did really successfully play into people's anxiety about the economy and their fears. Uh, people are really anxious. People are very fearful right now of where the economy is headed. I think that they were very successful in uh, utilizing that tactic in greater Minnesota and in the suburbs. Uh, it was negative and uh, it played on people's anxieties and fears. Uh, we were pushing a positive message with really good candidates. and. Uh, and the candidates would always report back, well, this isn't going to work, people aren't going to believe this, and we would like to agree with them. But uh, the financing, the focus, and the negativity district by district did obviously have a tremendous impact both here and across the country uh, in other states where we saw flips in Colorado, New York. Uh, we saw bluer states go bluer in uh, Maine and Massachusetts and other states it was seemed to be a trend. So you're not you're saying there's nothing wrong with the GOP brand even though you lost both majorities and you guys haven't the Republican Party hasn't won a statewide seat since 06 where Tim Pawlenty narrowly squeaked one out. You're saying there's nothing wrong with your your message there's nothing wrong with the brand right now. Well if you want to have the glass uh, three-fourths empty I guess you could say it that way. Um, it, it's, you know, from a standpoint, if it's a, a fair fight, again, if you want to talk about what you're for, what we're for, and let the voters decide, I, I think we win. But again, when you blame Travis Remke, a guy who's never held office before, living in Moorhead, Minnesota, for stealing $2.2 billion from kids, that's not a fair fight. I mean, and it's not true. You know, the, the education shift 
is paid back. It's not stealing. And when you use the word like stealing, that is a connotation with most voters that think the poor kids are going to have $2.2 billion less. How do they dare do that? So I don't, that's their, I don't think that's anything that I, you know, Matt and I, last time I checked, haven't campaigned on stealing from children. Uh, when that's the message that has been placed upon us, which they did a very good job of, uh, that's not what we ran on. We ran on improving the economy, Minnesota competitiveness, looking at our surrounding states, looking at where those states that are looking forward and are improving their economies, what they're doing. That's what we were going to do here. That's what we've done. We balanced a $6.2 billion deficit into a $1.2 billion surplus, started to pay back the education shift that the could have finished paying back our portion of it, but the governor vetoed that bill. So from a standpoint of what our message was and what was actually out there and what was well well overfunded, what we could compete with, I don't think that uh, most Minnesotans would say, yeah, I'm opposed to balancing a budget without a tax increase or without, I think we should have the status quo in schools. But that's not what was in the voters' mind because they got more mail than we did out there. They had better message, better messaging coordinating, like Matt said, on the negative versus what they'd be for. So, so are you saying that the Freedom Club and uh, Minnesota's future was all positive and sunshine? No, I, again, I said I'm more than happy to draw a contrast on somebody voting for so a tax increase. Contrast from no, uh, again, saying someone voted for a tax increase uh, or voted against an EBT card being used for alcohol and cigarettes or voting being in favor of the governor's tax bill, that I think is very fair game. To say that someone who's never been elected to office before, like Stacy Stout, is going to steal from Medicaid or Medicare, I mean, that's preposterous. But, again, it wasn't, uh, wasn't checked. It wasn't backed up. It wasn't, you know, in a lot of cases we can file complaints, but in some cases they don't come in until well after the election. So, again, I'm more than happy, and I will be the first one to admit, yes, we draw contrast with our mail, and I can't speak to the other groups that that you, you spoke about because that's coordination and I can't tell them what they can say about our candidates. However, I can absolutely tell you what we as a caucus ran and yes, I'm more than happy to say we had a contrast piece with some of our Democrat colleagues that showed that our candidate was better than theirs. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker do you take some comfort in the fact that these wave elections <laughs> seem to happen every two to four years now? It happened in 2002, 2006, 2010 and now in 2012. Uh, should anybody feel safe around here at any time? Uh, after the 06 election, I, I, <laughs> no one feels safe around here. And I, I, I think I even, you know, talking with some of you guys last week, I said, no, I don't take any election for granted, mine or majority. So I think, yeah, Minnesota is one of those states that will ebb and flow back and forth. And I absolutely expect next uh, election come around, there will be a little bit of a, of a correction. Um, but that's for you guys to pontificate about. And again, get Professor Jacobs in here and he'll give you all kinds of stats and data. And Are Tom you still going to run for leadership roles? Just, uh, oh, if I can just get back to Tom's question uh, about where the party is and where the party is going, I think there's probably two things that are important from the election of what the, what the voters said and what the elected folks heard they said. Uh, what I think the, you, when you go downstairs and talk to Paul Thiessen and talk to the Democrats and talk to Mark Dayton, what they will say they heard was uh, we probably need higher taxes and we need bigger government and we need uh, more of more government. Uh, I think they will propose that. That's what they've proposed in the past. And I think that the voters across the state of Minnesota will say, you know, excuse me, that's not actually what I said when I voted that way last year. And it's up to us to draw those very strong differences between the two and to present a clear prosperity-based uh, agenda moving forward. So um, I don't think uh, that what the voters said and what, they, what the Democrats hear downstairs are necessarily the same thing. And as a party, it's up to us to be very focused and to very clearly uh, outline where we're going to move. So, so what, did, what did the voters say? Because the speaker said this was all part of a national wave, had nothing to do with your message, had nothing to do with your candidates. What do you think the voters said when they asked you? That's not what I said. Well, I think that there obviously was uh, some things going on nationally, particularly in blue states getting bluer. Uh, we saw some shift. I think we saw some shift in the last three weeks. Obviously, in the state of Minnesota, things moved uh, in this state uh, moving ahead. Uh, but what they said is, we're anxious. You know, we're, we're probably scared. You know, I'm scared about my job. I'm scared about my mortgage. My house is worth 50% uh, less than it was four or five years ago. 
Uh, maybe we're working less. Maybe we had three job, two jobs. Now we have three jobs and make less money. So people were scared, and I think people were probably voting on a lot of economic anxiety uh, that the Democrats were better at channeling that anxiety. Uh, that it was not a positive message, but I think it was unfortunately successful, Rachel. So my question, are you two running for leadership positions? I'm not. I'm talking to the members right now. We're going to figure that out in the next few days. Uh, but right now everybody's out picking up their signs and uh, talking to a lot of members. And the, the biggest thing will be to recruit members moving forward. So uh, we're going to be helping out and... Uh, and moving that forward, but the biggest thing for us will be recruiting members. But you're thinking about running for some leadership position? Haven't. Uh, right now, I'm going to be out helping people pick up their signs and dust themselves off. Why not? No, I'm not. You know, it's uh, it's you know, it's never a good idea to make a, a big decision on uh, a little sleep and uh, a lot of uh, stress and anxiety. But uh, you know, I, I believe I've served my time. There's a fantastic bench of uh, members out there that uh, I think will uh, will do a great job. Now, obviously, I think uh, a lot of Matt and his ability, so if he's considering, I think it would be a great thing. Uh, but we've got a good bench of members that are coming back. We've got some, some really great new folks coming in as well. Like there's 15 freshmen, I think, if I remember the number right. So uh, it's a time for, and that's was always my plan anyway, to get a good bench ready so that when they come up, they'll be ready for the opportunity. So I look forward to figuring that out on Saturday. So you'll serve out your two years? Absolutely, yeah, when absolutely. Is, when is your leadership election? Uh, this Saturday. Uh, I don't know the actual location, but we, I'm sure you'll find out. Jody will let you know. About the running candidates in 2014, and this election is what it is. What do you plan to do in the interim, the two years you're not in the majority? Can you work in any fashion with these people in the governor? Is that mm -hmm. a, just any kind of possibility? Well, I, I think it's mostly up to them. You know, we, they uh, they now uh, don't need us for votes. They don't need to to talk to us about our ideas or what we want to see accomplished. So it'll be up to them. We'll offer, absolutely, we'll offer our bills, just like we did when we were in the minority before, offer our solutions, offer some you know new and innovative ways to reform government. You know, uh, very clearly, we're going to point out that making Minnesota a high-tax, high-regulated state would be bad for our economy. We'll, we'll make sure and point that out and actually offer an alternative, see where, here's where we would go. Um, but it primarily will be up to them. And I think they would be very, very foolish not to reach out to our members, uh, particularly Jim Abler and Health and Human Services. If they want to put together a bill that actually works, uh, Jim Abler can offer some ideas and also positive uh, relationships with stakeholders across the state in both parties. Mary Liz Holberg uh, knows how to balance a budget. Uh, I would strongly suggest uh, that they reach out to folks in our aisle, on our side of the aisle, our chairs, uh, that want to be helpful, want to be constructive, want to work together to move the state forward. I would strongly encourage Governor Dayton to do the same. I think that that's what Minnesotans expect us to do, uh, to work together and to balance the budget and move forward. Um, and all of our members, our new members and our returning chairs and other uh, veterans coming back want to work with the Democrats and the governor to do that. So we're going to be very constructive uh, and be as helpful both before session and afterwards as possible. Do you expect them to uh, pursue social issues, abortion, gay marriage, those types of things? Uh, the first thing in encountering the incoming majority will be a budget. And that will be the first uh, priority, I would assume, for them as it was for us. But what about gay? Resist social issues. Uh, you guys were not able to. That's a good question for them. 